Turnbull Root had met Lenore Carsby on the remote Hawaiian island of Leua in the summer of 1938. Lenore was there because she had crash landed her Lockheed Electra into the northern slope of the island's volcanic ridge and freewheeled into the oddly shaped natural canal known as the Keyhole, which cut through the island. Colonel Turnbull had been there because he had maintained a winter residence on the otherwise uninhabited island, where he liked to drink wine and listen to jazz recordings while he planned his next heist. They were an unlikely couple, but their first meeting took place in the kind of extreme circumstances that often cause hearts to beat faster and believe themselves in love. Lenore Carsby was a human Manhattan heiress, but also a founding mother of the 1990s, an organization of women in aviation first presided over by Amelia Earhart. When Earhart was lost in the Pacific, Lenore Carsby vowed that she herself would complete the journey that her friend and hero Amelia had begun. In April 1938, she took off from California with the Navigator and extra large fuel tanks. Six weeks later, Lenore Carsby arrived in the Keyhole with neither, having lost both to Lua's cruel crescent-shaped ridge. It was a miracle she herself survived, and probably protected only by the Lockheed's bubble cockpit. On his daily patrol, Unix had come across the heiress spread-eagled on a flat rock at the water's edge. She was not in good shape, dehydrated, one leg badly broken, delirious and on the verge of death. The sprite called it in, expecting to be given the execution order, but something about the human woman's face on his screen interested Turnbull. He instructed Unix not to do anything but to wait for his arrival. Turnbull took the trouble to shave, draw his hair back into a ponytail, and put on a fresh ruffled shirt before taking the lift from the subterranean cave to the surface. There he found Unix squatting over the most gorgeous creature he had ever seen. Even twisted unnaturally and covered with blood and bruises, it was clear to Turnbull that she was an exquisite beauty. As he stood over Lenore with the sun behind him casting long shadows across his face, the aviatrix opened her eyes, took Turnbull in, and said two words. My god! Then she was lost to delirium once more. Turnbull was intrigued. He felt a thaw around a heart which had been frozen for decades. Who was this woman who had fallen from the skies? Bring her inside, he told you, Unix. Use whatever magic we have to make her well. Unix did as he was told without comment, as was his way. Many other lieutenants might have questioned the wisdom of using the gang's dwindling supply of magic on a human. There was a newbie in the group who still had half a tank in him. When that was gone, who knew how long it would be before they had power again? But Unix did not complain, and neither did the others, as they were all aware that Turnball Root did not handle moaning well, and moaners tended to find themselves stranded somewhere uncomfortable, waiting for something extremely painful to happen to them. So, Lenore Carsby was taken to, into the subterranean cave and nursed back to health. Turnbull did not involve himself too much during the early stages, preferring to show up when Lenore was on the point of waking up, so he could pretend he had been there the whole time. Initially, Lenore did nothing but heal and sleep, but after some weeks she began to speak, hesitantly at first, but then questions tumbled out of her so quickly that Turnbull could hardly keep up. Who are you? What are you? How did you find me? Is Pierre my navigator alive? When will I be fit to travel? Generally, Turnbull handled questions about as well as he handled moaning, but from Lenore Carsby, every question caused him to smile indulgently and answer in detail. Why was this, he wondered. Why do I tolerate this human instead of simply tossing her to the sharks in the normal fashion? I'm spending time and magic on her in extravagant amounts. Turnbull began thinking about Lenore's face when he wasn't looking at it. Water chimes reminded him of her laugh. Sometimes, he was sure he could hear her call to him, though he was on the far side of the island. Grow up, you fool, he told himself. Yours is not the heart of a romantic. But the heart cannot lie, and Turnbull Root found himself in love with Lenore Carsby. He canceled two raids on federal bullion sites to be by her side, and moved his office to her room so she he could work while she slept. And for her part, Lenore loved him too. She knew he was not human, but she still she loved him. He told her about everything but the violence. Turnbull styled himself as a revolutionary on the run from an unjust state, and she believed it. Why wouldn't she? He was the dashing hero who had saved her, and Turnbull made sure none of his cronies shattered this illusion. When Lenore was well enough, Turnbull took her to Mount Everest in his shuttle, and she cried tears of amazement. As they hovered there, shrouded by the cold white mist, Turnbull asked the question he had been waiting to ask for two months. That first moment, my dear, when your eyes met mine, you said, My God, why did you say that? Lenore dried her eyes. I was half dead, Turnbull. You'll laugh and think me silly. Root took her hand. 
I could never think that. Never. Very well, I shall tell you. I said those words, Turnbull, because I thought I'd died and you were a fierce, handsome angel come to take me to heaven. Turnbull did not laugh and he did not think it silly. He knew at that moment that this gorgeous petite woman was the love of his life and he had to have her. So when Lenore began talking of her return to New York and how Turnbull would be the sensation of the city, he pricked the ball of his thumb with a quill, drew a thrall rune with the blood, and prepared himself a supper of mandrake and rice wine. The giant Amorphobot bore Turnbull Root to his beloved, who waited for him at the basement dock to their house in Venice. The house stood four stories high and had been commissioned by Turnbull himself in 1798, and built from the finest reconstituted Italian marble mixed with fairy polymers, which would absorb the gradual shift of the city without cracking. It took several hours to make the journey, during which time the Amorphobot kept Turnbull and his men alive, but periodically surfacing to replenish its cells with oxygen and spiking their arms with saline drips for nourishment. As they traveled, Turnbull logged on to the computer in the Amorphobot's belly to ensure that all was ready for the next stage of his plan. Turnbull found that he was very comfortable working in this sheltered environment with the world flashing by. He was insulated, yet in control. Safe. From the corner of his eye, through the bleary mask of gel, Turnbull was aware that Bob Ragby and Ching Mayo were now regarded him with something war approaching warship, following the spectacular nature of their escape. Warship. He liked that. As they approached the Italian coast, Turnbull felt his calm smugness desert him, as a nervous serpent crawled into his stomach. Lenore, how I've missed you. Since Turnbull had acquired a computer, there had been barely a day when they had not written to each other, but Lenore refused to participate in video calls, and of course Turnbull knew why. You will always be beautiful to me, my darling. The Amorphobot thrummed the length of Venice's Grand Canal, skirting the mounds of rubbish and corpses of murdered princes, until it stopped in front of the only subaquatic gate with an omni-sensor. The bot winked at the sensor, and the sensor winked back, and now that everyone was all pally, the gate opened without blasting them into the recessed neutrino lances on its pillars. Turbo winked at his crew. Thank goodness for that, eh? Sometimes that gate is a little unfriendly. It was difficult to talk with the slow surge of gel over one's teeth, but Turnbull felt the comet was worth it. Lenore would like that one. Turnbull's crew did not answer. Their accommodation inside the jail bot was a little more cramped than their captain's. They were squished together like salted slugs in a cone. The bot elongated itself to flow easily down the narrow channel to Turnbull's underground dock. Strip lights glowed in the gloom, what drawing them underneath the house. Deeper and deeper they went, until at last the bot expelled Turnbull gently onto a sloping slipway. He strained his coat, tightened his ponytail, and walked slowly along the ramp toward the slight figure waiting in the shadows. Put the others to sleep, he told the bot. I need to talk to my wife. A plasma charge crackled through the bot, knocking out the fairies inside. Unix barely had time to roll his eyes before passing out. Turnbull took a halting step, nervous as a teenage elf about to take his first moon flight. Lenore? Darling, I've come back to you. I've come back home. Please kiss me. His wife hobbled forward on the blackness, leaning heavily on an ivory-topped cane. Her fingers were gnarled with glowing rheumatoid knuckles. Her body was angular and unnatural, with sharp bones stretching the heavy lace of her skirt. One eye drooped and the other was closed completely, and the lines on her face were scored deep by time and black with shadows. Turnbull, as handsome as ever, it's so wonderful to see you free. Lenore's voice was a mere rasp, labored and painful. Now that you're home, she said haltingly, I can allow myself to die. Turnbull's heart lurched. He had palpitations and a red band of heat tightened around his forehead. Everything he had ever done suddenly seemed all for nothing. You can't die, he said furiously, rubbing the pad of his thumb, heating the room. I love you. I need you. Lenore's eyelids fluttered. I cannot die, she repeated. But why not, Turnbull? I'm too old for life. Only my longing to see you again has kept me alive. But my time has passed. I regret nothing except that I never flew again. I wanted to, but I didn't. Why was that? My hold is weakening. The old spell has died. You chose a life with me, my darling, he said, rushing the last steps to her side. 
But now that I've found the secret to eternal youth, you can be young again, and soon you will fly wherever you want to go. Terma felt the tiniest pressures as, his, as her fragile hand squeezed his fingers. I would like that, my dear. Of course you would, said Turnbull, steering his wife to the basement elevator. And now you should rest. I have a lot to organize before we leave. Lenore allowed herself to be led, feeling, as always, powerless to resist her charismatic husband. That's my Turnbull, always coming to my rescue. One of these days, <laughs> I'll rescue you. You do rescue me, said Turnbull sincerely. Every day. A barb of guilt picked his heart, as he knew he could never allow Lenore to fly again. For if she could fly, then she might fly away. Turnbull was shocked and frightened by how feeble Lenore had become. Somehow, the simple act of marrying a fairy had slowed down her aging process, but now it seemed that he could delay her decline no longer. Turnbull took his fear for his wife, turned it into rage, and pointed it at his crew. We have a historic opportunity here! He shouted at the small group who were assembled in the second story library. To strike a blow at the heart of our ancient enemy and also secure a supply of magic that will never run dry. If one of you useless jerrats rats fail in this task, there will be nowhere on this earth you can hide from me. I will hunt you down and peel a skin from your head. Do you understand? They understood. Historically, Turnbull's threats were usually vague and stylish. When he got down to specifics, then the captain was close to the edge. Good, good. Turnbull took a breath. Is everything ready, Quartermaster? Quartermaster Ark Sewell stepped forward. Sewell was an unusually tall gnome who had, until quite recently, been an internal affairs officer for the LAP. Having been demoted to private following an investigation into the ethics of his own methods, Sewell had cashed in whatever years he had and decided he would use the accumulated knowledge of decades of criminal investigation to make himself some of the gold that gnomes were almost hypnotically attracted to. He would advertised his services at the Sozzle Parrot and soon had been picked up by Turnbull, anonymously at first, but now they were meeting face to face. Everything's ready, Captain, he said, tones clipped back straight. The shuttle we acquired from the LEP Pound has been fitted out as an Atlantis ambulance, and I managed to trim the budget quite a bit and took the liberty of ordering a few new dress suits for you. Excellent work, Quartermaster, said Turnbull. Your share has just gone up 3%. Initiative pays. Never forget that. He rubbed his hands. How soon can we leave? As soon as you give the word, Captain, the ambulance is on the jet and ready for push-off. The laser? Modified as requested. Small enough to fit in your pocket. I find myself liking you quite a bit, Sewell. Keep it up and soon you'll be a full partner. Sewell bowed slightly. Thank you, sir. Any casualties while you were doing the shopping? Not on our side, sir, said Sewell. And who cares about the other side, eh? Turnbull liked the idea of blood being spilled. They made the entire exercise seem worthwhile. Now, we all know I'm a selfish fairy. That's what's kept us alive and prospering, apart from our recent stint at the Council's pleasure. If I get what I want, then we all flourish. And what I want is a source of magic strong enough to make my wife young again. And if that source of magic can also make your dreams come true, so much the better. Until recently, there was no everlasting source, but now the demons have returned from Limbo, bringing a mighty warlock with them. A young demon who has taken the unusual name of Number One. Smarmy little upstart, said Sewell. Won't salute or wear a uniform. I'm taking 1% of your share back for interrupting, said Turnbull. Do it again and I'll take an arm. Sewell opened his mouth to apologize, but on consideration, decided that a little bow would suffice. You're new, you'll learn. And if you don't, at least Mr. Ragby will have a nice meal. He loves limbs. Ragby made the point of gnashing his large teeth. So, to continue uninterrupted, there's now a demon warlock in Haven. If we can take him, then he shields us forever and he brings my Lenore back to me. Questions? Bob Ragby raised a finger. Yes, Mr. Ragby. Won't this number one be hard to get to? Ah, oh, excellent question, Mr. Ragby. Not quite as stupid as you appear after all. And you're right. Generally, a person of this importance would be hidden away like the last stinkworm at a dwarf sludge pool party. But in the event of a disaster at sea, where the medical staff are stretched to their limits, such a powerful warlock will be pressed into service by the medical warlocks. 
so we will find him on the Aquana Nostriamis, the floating hospital. A broad smile spread across Ragby's face. And we have a fake ambulance. We do indeed, Bob. You put things together quickly. Ching had a question, too. A person like that with all this power? Surely the LEP are going to come after a person like that? This was exactly the question Turnbull wanted asked. He was delighted by how his presentation was going. Let me answer your question with one of my own, just to get your mind working, because I have faith that you're not just a stupid goblin. Do you know why I had the space probe crash into the prison shuttle? Ching's reptilian face wrinkled in concentration and he absently licked his eyeballs as he thought. I thought you'd done that so the lepers would assume we were dead. Correct, Mr. Mayo. I orchestrated a huge catastrophe so everyone would believe we'd been killed. Turnbull shrugged. I don't feel bad about that. We're at war with the lepers, as you call them. If you take sides in a war, you can expect to be a target. I find myself a little bad about the next catastrophe. I'm a little sentimental about hospitals. I was born in one. Bob raised the same finger again. Uh, Captain, was that a joke? Turnbull beamed a charming smile. Why, yes it was, Mr. Ragby. Bob Ragby started to laugh. Artemis Fowl felt the tentacles of the giant squid tighten around him. Saucer-sized, spherical suckers latched onto his pressure suit, slobbering on the surface, searching for purchase. Each cup was lined with rings of razor-sharp chitin teeth, which gnashed viciously on Artemis's protected limbs and torso. Eight arms, if I remember correctly, thought Artemis, which is two fours. Die, die. Artemis almost giggled. Even in the death grip of the biggest squid ever to be seen by man, he was persistent with his compulsive behavior. Won't be long now before I count my words again. When the squid's biting suckers could not gain access to the tender meat inside, it held Artemis away from the giant mantle. The next stage of the squid's assault was to batter Artemis with one of its two longer tentacles, which swung it like a mace. Art Artemis felt the jarring blow, but his suit did not rupture. One, two, three, four, five! shouted Artemis defiantly. Wear the suit and stay alive! Number poetry. Back to square one. Three times more, the squid struck, and then it drew Artemis close in, circling bands of fat tentacle, and took his entire head inside its gnashing beak. The noise was exactly what Artemis had always imagined it would sound like if a giant squid tried to crack his sea helmet. If I get out of this, I will start thinking about girls like a normal 15-year-old. After several heart-stopping minutes, the squid apparently gave up and dashed Artemis down in a nest of bones and sea junk that had assembled on a high shelf at the edge of a wa underwater cliff. Artemis lay on his back and watched as the creature expanded its mantle cavity, filling it with hundreds of gallons of seawater, then contracted the mantle, shooting itself into the near pitch black of deep water. Artemis felt that in the circumstances, a slangory was justified. Wow, he breathed. Of all the things that have almost killed me, that was the most fearsome. After several minutes, Artemis' heart rate slowed enough to extinguish the flashing heart readout on his suit, and he felt that he could move without throwing up. I've moved position, he said into his helmet, in case Foley's phone, which was stuck to the helmet over his forehead, was actually still functional. I intend to try and take some bearings so you can come and rescue me. Move position, said Foley's voice, which was transmitted faintly by vibration through the helmet's polymer, so that it seemed to come from everywhere. That's an understatement, we're trying to catch up! Look for landmarks, said another voice. Butler. We can use them to triangulate with Foley's phone and pinpoint your position. This was a hopeful plan at best, but Artemis felt that it was better to have something to do rather than just wait for his air to run out. Actually, how much air do I have? Foley, of course, was the one to answer that technical question. The suit has functioning gills that draw oxygen from the ocean, so we'll keep breathing as long as you're dead, so to speak. Not that you're going to die. Artemis turned over and raised himself onto all fours. Any difficulty he experienced was due to his body being in shock from the cephalopod attack, not the pressure suit, which was functioning perfectly and would later go on to win an industry award for its performance that day. Take five steps, Artemis urged himself. Just five. Whatever you do, don't stop at... One less than five. Artemis took five shuffling steps, feeling his way along the edge, carefully avoiding shuffling off into the abyss. He could probably survive the drop, but he had no desire to have to climb back up again. I'm on a long, flat ledge with the lip of the trench, he said softly, anxious not to disturb any vibration-sensitive creatures. Sharks, for example. 
he realized that the squid had dropped him into some kind of nest. Perhaps the creature did not actually sleep here, but it seemed to feed in the spot and collect things that interested it. There were several skeletons, including a gigantic ribbed remains of a sperm whale, which Artemis first mistook for a shipwreck. There were small boats, huge brass propellers, great chunks of gleaming quartz, phosphorescent rocks, various crates, and even a mangled orange deep sea submarine with graying skeletons inside. Artemis moved quickly away from the craft, even though his intellect assured him that the skeletons could not harm him. Part of me if I don't completely trust my intellect these days. He noticed that in all this rubble, there did not appear to be any fairy made articles, which with even Atlantis just over the crest. Then Artemis saw that he was mistaken. There was, no more than 30 feet from him, a small, slick, metallic computer cube with unmistakable fairy markings which seemed to float just above the surface of the ledge. No, wait, not floating, suspended in gel! Artemis poked the gel gingerly, and when there was no reaction apart from a gentle fizzy spark, he plunged his sheathed hand into the gel up to the shoulder, grasping the cube by a corner. With the aid of the suit's servo motors, he easily pulled it free. Wreckage from the probe, perhaps, then said out loud, I have something. It could be pertinent. Are you seeing this, Foley? There was no reply. I need to get back to the ship or into the crash crater, somewhere away from the giant squid who wants to nibble my flesh and suck my marrow. Artemis immediately regretted thinking the suck my marrow bit, as it was far too graphic, and now he felt like throwing up again. I don't even know which way to go, he realized. The entire venture was ill-advised. What are the chances I would find a clue at the bottom of the ocean? An ironic statement, as it turned out, because he held a vital clue in his hands. Artemis swung his head this way and that, to see if whatever was caught in the beams of his helmet could spark off an idea. Nothing. Just an almost transparent fish propelling its bloated body with stubby fins and filtering plankton through its circular nostrils. I need something to happen, thought Artemis a little desperately. The idea occurred to him that he was not lost alone underneath six miles of crushing open with not much in the idea of what to do next. Artemis had always performed well under pressure, but that was usually the intellectual pressure a person might experience at the end of a taxing chess match, not the kind of pressure that could splinter a person's bone and squeeze every bubble of air from their lungs. Actual water pressure. As it turned out, something happened. The squid came back, and a bore in the grip of its larger tentacles would appear to be the space probe's nose cone. I wonder what it wants that for, wondered Artemis. It's almost as if he's actually manipulating a tool. But to what end? What nut would a giant squid wish to crack? Me! Artemis blurted. I'm the nut! Artemis could have sworn the squid winked at him before bringing the five-ton chunk of spacecraft swinging down toward the most mostral meat with his blue shell. I'm the nut! Artemis shouted again a little hysterically. It must be said. He backpedaled along the ledge, the suit's motors leading him at little speed. Just enough feet per second to feel the force of the swing, but not the metal itself. The probe's prow cut through the rock like a cleaver through soft meat and carved a V-shaped trench that ran between the soles of Artemis' feet. So much for being a genius, thought Artemis bitterly. One grand gesture and I'm fish food. The squid yanked its weapon free from the rock and held it high, pumping its mantle cavity full of water for the next effort. Artemis' back was literally against the wall. He had nowhere to go and made an easy target. Butler! called Artemis, purely out of habit. He had no real expectation that his bodyguard could miraculously materialize at his side, and even if he did, it would just have to be to die here. The squid closed one huge eye, taking careful aim. These things are smarter than scientists think, thought Artemis. I do wish I had been able to write a paper. The prow came hammering down, compressing water, then pushing it aside. Metal filled Artemis's vision, and it occurred to him that this was the second time this particular prow had almost crushed him. Except this time it's not an almost. But it was to be almost. An orange circle pulsed in Artemis's helmet readout, and he prayed that it was a sign that electromagnetic connection had been established between his suit and the ship. It was. Artemis felt a gentle tug, then a fierce one that yanked him off the ledge straight up toward the hovering mercenary craft. In the light of his suit beams, he could see a magnetic plate in the ship's belly. Underneath him, the squid abandoned its improvised mallet and bunched itself for pursuit. I probably slowed down before I hit that plate, Artemis thought hopefully. He didn't, but the impact hurt a lot less than a blow from an armored giant squid. 
Generally, the diver would be taken inside immediately, but in this case, Holly decided that it would be best to leave Artemis where he was and put a little distance between them and the squid, which Artemis would later agree was the correct decision, even though at the time he was screaming. Artemis craned his neck around to see the massive dome of the squid's head jutted after them, tentacles behind rippling like skipping ropes. Skipping ropes with razor-lined suckers and enough power to crush an armored vehicle, not to mention the ability to manipulate tools. Holly! He shouted. If you can hear me, go faster! Apparently, she could hear him. Holly took the ship deep into the impact crater, and when she was absolutely sure the squid was off their scopes, she flipped the magnetic plate, and Artemis was dumped into the airlock, still clutching the fare box to his chest. Hey, look! said Mulch once the airlock had drained. It's the nut! He ran in small circles around the bay, squealing. I'm the nut! I'm the nut! The dwarf stopped for a laugh. He cracks me up, really. Butler hurried to Artemis' side. Cut him some slack, Diggums. He just tangled with a giant squid. Mulch was not impressed. I once ate one of those things. A big one, not a minnow like that fella. Butler helped Artemis with the helmet. Anything broken? Can you move your fingers and toes? What's the capital of Pakistan? Artemis coughed and stretched his neck. Nothing broken, digits all mobile, and the capital of Pakistan is in Islamabad, which is noteworthy for having been built to be the capital. Okay, Artemis, said Butler. You're fine. I won't ask you to count to five. I would rather count in fives if you don't mind. Foley, congratulations on building such a sturdy phone with an excellent tracking program. Holly hit the water flaps to slow the ship's forward motion. Find anything? Artemis held out the hardware cube. Wreckage from the probe. This was covered in some kind of gel. Interesting texture, loaded with crystals. Something of yours, Foley? The centaur clopped over and took the small metal box. It's the heart of a metaphorvobot, he said fondly. These little guys were perfect foragers. They could absorb anything, including each other. Maybe they just absorbed the turnball guy and his buddies, said Juliet half-joking. Artemis was about to explain in patronizingly simple terms exactly why this wasn't possible, when it occurred to him that it was indeed possible. Not only that, it was probable. They weren't programmed to be act as rescue vessels, said Foley. Holly scowled. If you tell me one more time that those amorphobots weren't programmed to do something, then I'll have to shave your hindquarters while you sleep. Artemis crawled to the steel bench. Are you saying that you people knew about these amorphobots all the time? Of course we did. They attacked us in Iceland, remember? No, I was unconscious. That's right. Seems like ages ago. So I endured trial by squid for nothing? Oh no, not for nothing. It would have taken me minutes to make the connection, and even then it would only have been a theory. Foley typed a code into his phone, releasing it from the pressure suit's helmet. Whereas now we can check the programming. Foley hooked his phone to the bot's brain and was delighted to see its readout light up. He ran a few checks and was easily able to pinpoint the shadow program. That's a little puzzling. The bot was sent on a new mission parameters by the control orb. Charmingly enough, it's actually telling its gel to kill us all right now. That's why we never detected any outside interference. There was none. It's a simple little shadow program, a few lines of code, that's all. Simple to kill. He did so with a few taps of the keyboard. Where is this control orb? asked Artemis. It's in my lab in Haven. Could it have been tampered with? Foley didn't even have to think about this for long. Impossible! And I'm not just being typical me and denying that my equipment is responsible. I check that thing most days. I ran a systems check yesterday and there was nothing out of the ordinary in the whole orb's history. Whoever set this up had been feeding the probe instructions for weeks, if not months. Artemis closed his eyes to blot out the shining four that had appeared in his vision, floating around the craft's interior, hissing malignantly. I managed to survive a, survive a giant squid attack and now I'm worried about hissing fours. Great. I need everyone to sit in a line on the opposite bench, small to tall. That's the Atlantis complex talking, mud boy, said Holly. Fight it! Artemis pressed the heels of his hands into his eye sockets. Please, Holly, for me? Mulch was delighted with this game. Should we all hands our chant? How about five keep me alive, four makes my bottom sore? Number poetry, said Artemis skeptically. That's ridiculous. Please, sit where I ask. They did, reluctantly and grumbling, Foley and Mulch arguing for a moment over who was smaller. There was no argument over who was tallest. Butler sat hunched on the end, chin almost between his knees. Beside him sat Juliet, then Foley, then Mulch, and finally Holly, who had set the ship on neutral. Five, 
thought Artemis. Five friends to keep me alive. He sat, still clad on the pressure exoskeleton suit, watching his friends and taking strength, letting his ideas build. Finally, he said, Foley, there must have been a second orb. Foley nodded. There was. We always grow a backup, in case we use the clone because the original was damaged. Only minor damage, true, but you can't take chances with space travel. The first was sent off to be incinerated. Where? Atlantis. Cowboy Labs got the contract. This was obviously before we realized how deranged Opal was. So, if we accept that Turnbull Root got a hold of the second orb and had it repaired by Vishby or whoever else worked for him, then would the probe obey commands from that orb? Of course, no questions asked. That could be sent by any computer with a satellite link. Butler raised a finger. Can I say something? Of course, old friend. Foley, your security sucks. When are you guys going to learn? A few years ago, the goblins built a shuttle. Now you have convicts running your space program. Foley stamped a hoof. Hey, pal, less of the judgmental attitude. We've stayed hidden for thousands of years. That's how good our security is. 5, 10, 15, 20, shouted Artemis. Please, we need to work quickly. Can we tease you about this later, said Mulch. I have some great material. Later, said Artemis. For now, we need to work out where Turnball is going and what his final objective is. When there was no argument, he continued. If we assume that Turnball used his orb to control the probe and use these Amorphobots to carry him away, can we track the Amorphobots? Foley's head movement was somewhere between a nod and a shake. Possibly, but not for long. Artemis understood. The gel dissipates in salt water. That's right, the friction between the water and the bots wear down the gel, but as soon as it separates from the brain, it begins to dissolve. No charge, no cohesion. I'd say with a melon-sized bubble, you might get a few hours. It's already been a few hours. How much longer do we have? It may already be too late. If I was allowed out of my school desk, I might be able to tell you. Of course, please. Foley swung his arms forward, lifting himself from his awkward seating position, and clopped into the cockpit, where he quickly entered the gel's chemical makeup into the gyro's rudimentary computer and dropped a filter over the portholes. Luckily for us, the mercenaries decided to leave the scanners intact. Everyone pick a window. I've run a scan for a specific radiation, and the gel trail should show up as a luminous green. Shout if you see something. They all took a porthole except Holly, who sat in the pilot's chair, ready to take off in whichever direction the trail led. I see it, said Mulch. No, wait, it's a really angry squid looking for his little nut. Sorry, I know that was inappropriate, but I'm hungry. There, called Juliet. I see something, port side. Artemis switched to her porthole. Winding from the depths of the crater was a wispy stream of shining bubbles that disappeared as they watched it, the lower bubbles separating into smaller blobs, then toward the end of the trail, some were disappearing altogether. Quickly, Holly, said Artemis urgently. Follow those bubbles. Holly opened the throttle. Now there's an order I never, I never thought I'd hear from you. They sped after the bubble tree on the mercenary's gyro, though Foley did argue that technically they were not bubbles, but globules, for which information he received a punch in the shoulder from Juliet. Hey, don't punch me, protested the centaur. Technically that was a rap, not a punch, corrected Juliet. Now this, this is a punch. The trail grew fainter before their eyes, and Holly quickly programmed into a projected course whenever the globules changed direction, just in case they disappeared altogether. Artemis sat in the co-pilot's chair with a hand over one eye and a second hand in front of his face. The thumb is generally acknowledged to be a finger, he told Holly, in which case we're safe because that makes five fingers, but some experts argue that the thumb is completely different and is one of the things that sets us apart from the animals, and in that case we only have four fingers on each hand, and that's bad. He's getting worse, thought Holly anxiously. Butler was stumped. If someone were threatening Artemis, the correct protective action was usually pretty obvious. Clobber the bad guy and confiscate his weapon. But now the bad guy was Artemis' own mind, and was turning him against everyone, including Butler. How can I trust any order Artemis gives me? The bodyguard wondered. He could simply be a ruse to get me out of the way, like Mexico. He squatted beside Artemis. You do have faith in me now, don't you, Artemis? Artemis tried to meet his eyes, but couldn't manage it. I'm trying, old friend. I want to, but I know as soon as I won't, I have the strength. I need help, and soon. They both knew what Artemis wasn't saying. I need help before I go out of my mind entirely. They followed the jail trail eastward toward the Atlantic and around the tip of Gibraltar into the Med. In the early afternoon, the trail died suddenly. 
The last green bubble popped, and suddenly they were 50 feet underwater, two miles outside the Golfo di Vienza, with nothing but yachts and gondolas and the gyroscopes. It has to be Venice, said Holly, bringing the ship to periscope depth, taking the opportunity to fill the air tanks and equalize. It's right in front of us. Venice is a big city, said Butler, and not an easy place to search. How are we going to find these guys? The Morphobot brain in Foley's hand suddenly beeped as it established a link with its brethren. I don't think that's going to be a problem. They're close. Very close. Very, very close. Artemis was not happy with this melodramatic statement. Very, very close? Really, Foley? You're a scientist. How close exactly? Foley pointed to the gyro's hatch. That close. The next minute or two were frantic and seemed to have an entire day worth of happenings compressed into a few moments. To Artemis and Foley, the whole thing was just flashes of color and blurred movement. Butler, Holly, and Juliet saw a little more being trained soldiers. Butler even managed to get off the bench, which did him absolutely no good whatsoever. The gyro's hatch made it sound like a gigantic plastic bottle being stepped on by a giant foot, then simply disappeared. Rather, it seemed to be dis to be disappear. It was actually torn backward with great force, then hurled into the sky. The hatch eventually lodged into the shaft of the bell tower of San Marco Piazza, which caused quite a bit of consternation in the city, especially for the painter whose rope was severed by the spinning hatch, and who plummeted a hundred feet to land on his brother's back. The brothers were already fighting, and this didn't make anything things any better. Back in the gyro, water immediately began flooding the ship's interior, but most of the available space was filled by the rolling forms of six amorphobots, which flowed into the bay, chittering as they selected their targets. It was all over in less than a second. The bots pounced on their targets, quickly engulfing them in turgid gel, and spirited them away to the azure blue of the Mediterranean. As they were whisked toward the murky form of the ferry ship in the depths, each prisoner had his or her own thoughts about what had happened. Artemis was stunned by how much this abduction reminded him of his time spent battling through the mind screen in his own brain. Holly wondered if her weapon would work inside the gunk or if it had been disabled yet again. Foley couldn't help feel a little fondness for the amorphobot that held him prisoner. After all, he had grown it in a lab beaker. Julia tried to keep Butler in sight. So long as she could see her brother, she felt reasonably safe. Butler thrashed for a moment, but quickly realized that his efforts were futile, and so drew himself in like a newborn, conserving his energy for one explosive movement. Mulch was also considering an explosive movement. Maybe he couldn't escape, but he could certainly make this blobby thing regret picking him up. The dwarf pulled his knees slowly to his chest and allowed the gas in his tubes to collect into long bubbles. Eventually, he would have enough force to blast through, or else he would be left floating in what looked like the world's largest lava lamp. Turnball Root was having a reasonably good time. He would have been having a wonderful time, but for the fact that his darling Lenore was in not the condition he would like her to be, and he was worried that if he was able to restore Lenore's facilities, she would quickly tumble to the fact that he was not quite the principal revolutionary he had always pretended to be, and he would lose her love. Lenore had a strong sense of morality, and she would definitely kick up a fuss at the idea of him imprisoning a demon warlock to keep her young forever. Turnbull glanced at the thrall rune on his thumb the intricate set of spirals and characters that kept Lenore on the hook, but the power of which was weakening all the time. Would she have left him without it? Maybe. Probably. Turnbull was possibly the world's foremost expert on runes. They suited his situation as they only required a tiny spark of magic to kickstart them, and thereafter operated on the power of the symbols themselves. Different people reacted differently to rune control. Some could be controlled for decades, while others would reject the black magic and go insane instantly. Lenore had been in the th ideal thrall because the large part of her wanted to believe what Turnball told her. With his modified laser, Turnball could enslave anyone he wished for as long as he wished, no matter how they felt about him and without the need for a single spark of magic. Like these new prisoners, for example. A verifiable treasure chest of talents at his disposal. One never knew when a teenage mastermind could come in handy, or a technical centaur, especially when it was well known that the little demon trusted them both. With these two and the warlock, he could start his own principality if he chose to. Yes, I'm having a reasonably good time, thought Turnbull, but soon I'll have be having an excellent time. Just one more set of people to kill. Maybe two. The Amorphobots had entered the ambulance through the airlock and morphed into one of the ambulance's only cell. Actually, the bot holding Mulch Diggums was excluded from the morph, as the other bots could not identify the chemical spectrum of the gas bubbles inside the dwarf's body, and did not frankly like the look of Mulch anyway, and so, though it tried to meld with the others, the bot was repulsed and wobbled lonely in the corner. 
Turnball Root descended the spiral staircase from the bridge and literally swaggered into the cell to gloat. Look here, he said to Unix, who stood at his shoulder grim as ever. The finest fairy and human minds all gathered together in one cell. The hung before him, suspended in smart gel, unable to do much beside take shallow breaths and move like sleepy swimmers. Don't even bother making the effort to call for help or shoot your way out, Turnball continued. I'm jamming your phones and weapons. He leaned close to the bot's shimmering surface. Here's one of Julius's little pups. Didn't we shoot her already, Unix? A leery smile tightened the sprite's jaw, though it did not make him seem a nicer person. And the great Foley, savior of the people. Not anymore, my little pony. Soon you'll be my thrall and delighted to be so. Turnbull wiggled his thumbs at the captives, and they could see the red runes painted there. And what have we here? Turnbull stopped in front of the butlers. Crazy bear and the jade princess. I missed you once before, but it won't happen a second time. What about me? Mulch managed to say, and the bot translated the vibrations of the larnix into sound. What about you? Don't I get a description? I'm dangerous too. Turnbull laughed, but softly so the noise would not awaken Lenore, who slept in the berth upstairs. I like you, dwarf. You have spirit, but nonetheless I shall kill you, as you are of no use to me, unless you fancy a position as Jester. A fat, smelly Jester. Obviously I'm assuming you smell bad. You certainly look as though you might. Turnbull t moved on to Artemis. And of course, Artemis Fowl. Ex-criminal mastermind and current psychotic. How's the complex going, Artemis? I bet you have a bad number. What is it? Five? Four? Artemis must have flinched because Turnbull knew he had guessed correctly. Four, then. And how do I know you suffer from Atlantis? You should ask your friend, Foley. He's the one who supplied me with pictures. Artemis was not at all surprised to find that some of his paranoia was actually justified. Turnbull paced along the line like a general delivering a pre-battle pep talk. I'm delighted that you're all here, genuinely delighted, because you can be useful to me. You see, my wife is very old, and to save her life and bring her youth back, I need a very powerful magician. Artemis' eyes widened. He got it straight away. All of this to lure number one out of Haven. Your friend, number one, will be helping out with the injured on the Nostriamus, and we were going to go in there, masquerading as patients, and bring him out with my super-duper modified lasers. But there was always going to be the niggly problem of that little fellow perhaps getting a magical bolt off before I enthralled him. But now, Holly Shore, one of his best friends in the whole world, is going to fetch him for me. Turnbull turned to Unix. Tell the bot to spit out Captain Short. Unix consulted a computer rendering of the bot and its contents to on the wall screen. With the flick of his finger, he dragged Holly from the gel. Almost instantaneously, the bot did the same. Holly felt as though she were being vomited from the belly of a beast onto the cold metal floor. She lay there gasping as her lungs accustomed themselves to breathing pure air once more. She opened her eyes to see a grinning turnball looming over her. I'm remembering more and more about you as time goes by he said, and kicked her hard in the ribs with one black boot. And I remember that you put me in prison. But never mind, eh? Now you can make up for it by doing me a good turn. Holly spat a blob of gel onto the deck. Not likely, Turnbull. Turnbull kicked her again. You will address me by my rank. Holly spoke through gritted teeth. I doubt it. I don't doubt it said Turnbull, and put his boot on her throat. From his pocket, he pulled what looked like a pen light. That, th this looks like a pen light, doesn't it? Holly could not speak, but she was guessing the slim cylinder was something more sinister than a light. Yep, it is quite a bit more than that. You may have guessed that black magic runes are something of a hobby of mine. Illegal, yes, but almost everything I do is illegal, so I start worrying now. What this ladle laser does is burn the rune directly into the skin of the person I wish to enslave. No magic necessary. As long as I have the corresponding room on my person, then you are in my thrall forever. Turnbull showed his thumb to Holly, the one with Vishby's room still inscribed on the pad, the magic of which could be transferred to her now that Vishby was dead. And guess what, my dear? A free slot just opened up in my organization. Root activated the laser and hummed for a moment until the tip turned red. Then he jammed it into Holly's neck, branding her with his binding rune. Holly bucked and screamed in a black magic fit. 
Not so gentle as the touch, noted Turnbull, stepping out of puke range just in case. The fit lasted less than a minute, leaving Holly rigid on the floor, breathing abnormally fast, eyes, eyelids fluttering. Turnbull licked the blood room on his own thumb. Now, Miss Short, what say we go and kidnap a warlock? Holly stood, arms stiff by her side, eyes unfocused. Yes, Captain, she said. Turnbull clapped her on the back. That's more like it, Short. Isn't it liberating not to have a choice? You just do what I say and nothing is your fault. Yes, Captain. Most liberating. Turnbull handed her a neutrino. Feel free to kill anyone who gets in your way. Holly checked the battery level expertly. Anyone who gets in my way, I kill them. I like these lasers, said Turnbull, twiddling the rune pen. Let's do someone else. Tell the Bob to pop young out Fowl out of his bubble, Unix. It'll be nice to have a pet genius. Unix dragged his finger across the touchscreen, and Artemis flopped, gasping under the floor like a fish out of water. The young demon warlock, who chose to call himself number one, was feeling extremely sad. He was a sensitive little fellow, though you would not think of it to look at his grey armor-plated hide and a squat head that seemed to push its way out of its lumpy shoulders, but he felt others' pain, and this trait, according to his master, was what made him such an excellent warlock. There was a lot of pain in the fairy world today. The Martian probe disasters in Iceland and the Atlantis Trench were the worst fairy disasters to have occurred in recent times. To the humans, injury on this scale would probably not even make it to the big news stations, but the fairy folk were small in number and cautious by nature. So to have two probe-related disasters in one cycle was horrific. But at least a larger catastrophe had been averted by the efficient evacuations of Atlantis. Number one had barely begun to grieve for the loss of his friends in Iceland when the LEP had informed him that Holly, Foley, and Artemis had actually survived. Commander Troublekilb asked him to go to Atlantis on the Nostriamus hospital ship to heal, help heal those injured by the probe's blast wave. The little demon had immediately agreed, hoping that he could distract himself for a short period, at least by using his powers to help others. And now, news had filtered through that Holly's escape pod had gone down to, at sea, and all hands were presumed lost. It was too much to process. Dead, alive, then dead again. If Holly had some magic in her system, number one might have been able to sense her out there somewhere, but he could feel nothing. So for the past several hours, number one had worked himself ragged, lying hands on the injured. He had knitted bones, sealed gashes, repaired ruptured organs, drawn salt water from lungs, draped veils of calm over hysteria, and, in extreme cases, wiped the entire pileup from people's memory. For the first time since he had blossomed as a warlock, Number One was actually feeling a little depleted. But he couldn't leave right now, as word had just come over the aquanaut speakers that yet another ambulance had docked. I need to sleep, he said warily, but not to dream. I would only dream of Holly. I can't believe she's gone. And something made him look up at that moment, and he saw Holly Short walking down the corridor toward the quarantine door. The sight was so unexpected that Number One was strangely unsurprised. It's Holly, but she's moving weirdly, as though she's underwater. Number One finished the bone knit he was working on, then left the cleanup to a nurse. He shambled toward the secure door, where Holly was having her retina scanned. The computer accepted her LEP credentials and popped open with a pneumatic hiss. Number One skipped outside to prevent Holly entering. We have to keep that area germ-free, he said, worried that this had to be the first words he uttered to his resurrected friend. And you look like you just escaped from toxic garbage. Then he hugged her tightly. You smell like a toxic dump too, but you're alive, thank goodness. Tell me, did Foley survive? Please say he did. And Artemis, I couldn't bear if I have heard you hear you were all gone. Holly did not meet his eyes. Artemis is sick, I need you to come. Number one was immediately desolate, his mood swinging rapidly like a small child's. Artemis is sick? Oh no! Bring him in and we can take care of him. Holly turned back the way she had come. No, he can't be moved. You need to follow me. Number one jogged after his friend, Holly, without a moment's hesitation. Is it a broken bone? Is that it? Artemis can't be moved. Is Folly okay? Where did you guys go? But there were no answer for the little demon, and all he could do was follow Holly's square shoulders through throngs of walking wounded, past the cots that had been erected in the hallways. The smell of disinfectant burned his nostrils, and the cries of the injured seared his heart. I'll just fix Artemis quickly. Maybe lie down for a minute and get back to work. Number one was a good soul, and it would never for a moment occur to him to probe Holly a little to make sure that she was fully herself. It never crossed his mind that one of his closest friends could be leading him into a life of servitude. 
Turnbull sat by Lenore's bed in the stolen shuttle ambulance, holding her hand while she slept. He felt a little giddy about changing his plan at the last minute. It was quite the cavalier move, and the rush of adrenaline reminded him of his younger days. It was all seat of the pants stuff before I went to prison, he confided to the sleeping Lenore. I was captain of the LEP and running the underworld at the same time. To be honest, there wasn't much of an underworld before I came along. In the morning, I would chair a meeting at the task force that was trying to apprehend me, and in the evening, I would be doing black market deals with the goblin gangs. Turnbull smiled and shook his head. Ugh, good days. Lenore did not react, as Turnbull had thought it best to give her just a drop of sedative until the warlock had restored her youth. He knew from her talk of death that he was losing his grip on his wife, and she was not strong enough to survive another thrall rule. So sleep, my darling. Sleep. Soon all will be as it was. As soon as Captain Short returned with the demon, and if she didn't, well, then he would board the Nostriamus and take the warlock by force. Perhaps he'd lose a crew member or two, but they should be glad to die for their captain's wife. One level down, in the brig, Bob Ragby was on guard duty, a duty that he was enjoying immensely as he considered it payback for all the years he himself had been lorded over by guards. It didn't matter that to Bob that his jailbound prisoners weren't actually the people who had watched over him, that was just their bad luck. He was taking special pleasure in teasing Mulch Diggums, whom he had long considered a competitor in the Top Criminal Dwarf competition that he had played in his head during the long hours spent on the toilet, thanks to a diet of processed food. Turnbull had ordered him to split the Nemorphobots for safety, and now one hung in each corner of the cell like a giant wobbling egg sack. If any of them were to act up, then use the shocker feature under your own discretion, Turnbull had said. If they try to shoot their way out, make sure you get that on video so we can have a good laugh later. Rigby had decided he would definitely use the shocker at the first provocation. Maybe before the first provocation. I dig ems. Why don't you try to eat some of the gel so I have an excuse to electrocute you? Mulch did not waste his energy talking. He simply barred his enormous teeth. Yeah, they ain't so big. The more I look at you, Diggums, the less I believe all that junk your little groupie spew back at the souls of parrot. You don't look that much of a burglar to me, Diggums. I think you're a phony, a fraud, a tail-spinning liar. Mulch brought a hand up to his face. Yawn. Artemis had been returned to the grip of his amorphobot once the brain had been completed, and with nothing to do but think in its clammy folds, he could feel whatever was left of his battered personality slipping away. The rune on his neck had taken hold of his willpower in a vice-like grip, and while he could think and speak at the moment, it took a lot of effort, and he guessed that only he had rudimentary functions because Turnbull hadn't given him any specific instructions yet. Once he had his orders, he would be powerless to resist. Turnbull would be able to order me to do anything, he realized. Through the distorting field of gel, Artemis could see Ragby taunting Mulch and thought that perhaps would be a good idea if he joined the argument. Speaking through the gel was a tricky affair that involved forming the words through clenched teeth, which kept the gel out of, but allowed it to pick up vibrations in the throat. Hello, Mr. Agby, he said. The Amorphobot sprouted a gel speaker and translated the vibrations into words. I look, said Ragby. The thrall speaks. What do you want, mud boy? A little shock, is that what you want? Artemis decided that highbrow intellectual argument was not the way to go with this person, and chose to go straight for the personal insult. I want you to have a bath, dwarf. You stink. Ragby was delighted to have a little diversion. Wow, that's like actual grown-up fight and talk. You do know that your bodyguard is out of action. If Butler had been equipped with laser eyeballs, Bob Ragby would have had holes bored right through his skull. What are you up to, Artemis? wondered Butler. This kind of insult is not your style. I don't need a bodyguard to dispose of you, Ragby, continued Artemis. Just a bucket of water and a wire brush. Funny, said Ragby, though he sounded a little less amused than previously. Perhaps some disinfectant so your germs will not spread. I have a fungus, said Ragby. It's a real medical condition that's very hurtful of you to bring it up. Aw, is the big tough dwarf in pain? Ragby had enough. Not as much pain as you, he said, and instructed the bot to pass a charge through its gel sack. Artemis was attacked by shards of white lightning. He jittered for a moment like a marionette in the hands of a toddler, then relaxed, floating unconscious in the gel. Ragby laughed. Not so funny now, are ya? 
Buller growled, which would have been menacing had not his bot speakers translated it as a robotic purr. Then he began to push. It should have been impossible for him to make any impact without traction, but somehow he actually managed to descend the gel, causing the bot to chitter as though being tickled. You guys are hilarious, said Ragby, and allowed Butler to wear himself out for a few minutes before he grew bored and shocked the bodyguard. Not enough to knock the big human out, but certainly enough to calm him down a little. Two down, he said cheerily. Who's next? Me, said Mulch. I'm next. Bob Ragby turned to find Mulch Diggums rolled into a ball. Rear end pointed directly at Bob himself. The rear end was not covered by any material, or in other words, it was a bare bottom and it meant business. Ragby, as a dwarf himself and a subscriber to Where the Wind Blows Monthly, knew exactly what was about to happen. No way, he breathed. He should shock Diggums, he knew, but this was too much entertainment to pass up. If things got out of hand, he could press the button. Until then, no harm in watching. Just in time, he remembered to press record on the security cameras, in case the captain wanted to look later. Go on, Diggums. If you actually break free, then I'll present my own backside for a good kicking. Mulch did not reply. Breathing was too difficult inside the jail to go wasting any precious energy trading insults with Bob Ragby. Instead, he wrapped his forearms around his shins and bore down on his colon, which was inflated like a very long balloon snake. Go, Mulch! whooped Ragby. Make your people proud. Just so you know, this will be up on the Ethernet in about five minutes. The first bubble to emerge was cantaloupe-sized. These big bubbles were known among dwarf tunnelers as corkers, from back in the days when corks were used to cap bottles. Often a corker had to be cleared before the main flow could begin. Good-sized corker, Bob Ragby admitted. Once the corker was out of his system, Mulch followed it with a flurry of smaller squibs, then it, which emerged into the gel with the initial speed that was quickly arrested by the bot's gel. Is that it? called Gob, the big, a little disappointed truth be told. Is that all you got? That was not all Mulch had got. A hundred more assorted squibs quickly followed, some spheres, some ellipses, and sweat Ragby swore he saw a cube. Now you're just showing off, he shouted. The bubbles just kept on coming in various sizes and shapes. Some were transparent, some suspiciously opaque, and a few had wisps of gasp inside that crackled when they hit the gel. The bot chittered nervously, the metal hardware heart flashing orange as its built-in spectrometer struggled to analyze the gas components. Now that is I've not seen before, said Bob, his finger hovering over the shocker button. Still, the bubbles flowed, inflating the Amorphobot to twice its original size. Its chitterings climbed the octaves until eventually they shattered near, nearby medical beakers and climbed to ultrasonic wavelengths, too high for the humans and fairies to hear. The shrieking has stopped, thought Bob. That must mean the danger's passed. He couldn't have been more wrong. Moach was virtually invisible now, behind the bubbles, his image twisted and refracted by their curved surfaces. More and more bubbles were produced. Mulch seemed to be the dwarf equivalent of a clown's car that could hold more passengers than would seem to be allowed by the laws of physics. The Amorphobot was stretched to its limits and its surface was dappled by the pressure. It began bouncing on the spot, venting bursts of mysterious smoky gas. Well, Mulch, it's been fun, said Bob Ragby, and reluctantly pressed the shocker button, which, as it turned out, was the wrong thing to do. Even the Amorphobot tried to refuse the order, but Ragby insisted, jabbing the button again and again until the familiar crackling sparkled from two nodes on its metallic heart. Any first aid chemistry student could have told Ragby never to put sparks near a mystery gas. Unfortunately, Ragby had never met any first aid chemistry students, and so it came to a, as a total surprise to him when the gas passed by Mulch Diggums ignited, bubble after bubble, in a chain reaction of many explosions. The bot expanded and ruptured, gel jets erupting from its surface. It bounced from floor to ceiling like pinball across the cell, running Ragby over like a giant tire. It was a testament to Foley's design and standards that the Amorphobot held its integrity even under such extreme circumstances. It transferred gel from unscorched sections and grafted them onto ruined areas. Ragby lay stunned on the deck while the bot came to rest across the hatch, shuddering and heaving. In cases like this, it had a deep-rooted self-preservation order that Turnbull had not thought to override. In the event that a sample collected by one of the Amorphobots proved dangerous to the bot's systems, then that subject was to be immediately ejected. And this pungent dwarf was definitely dangerous, so the damaged Amorphobot hawked Mulch Diggums onto the blackened deck, where he lay smoking. I never should have had that Volcari, he mumbled, then passed out. 
Bob Ragby was the first dwarf to recover. That was something, he said, then spat out a lump of charred gel. Ugh, you got out, darn it if you didn't, so I suppose by rights I should present my behind for a kicking. Ragby lowered his wide bottom toward Mulch's unconscious face, but got no reaction. No takers? Well, you can't say I did an offer. Here, said a voice behind him. Let me kick that for you. He twisted his neck around just in time to see an enormous boot heading for his behind, and behind that boot there was an angry head, which, in spite of being a little out of focus because of Bob's perspective, unmistakably belonged to a human butler. Mulch had never believed he would actually get out of the uh, Morphobot's belly, but he hoped to distract Bob Ragby for a few moments so that Foley could come up with one of his genius techie plans. And that was exactly what had happened. While Ragby had been occupied watching the gastroabex of his fellow dwarf, Foley had been busy sinking the bot core Artemis had picked up on the impact site with the core in its own Morphobot. In a laboratory, it would have taken about 10 seconds to connect and send a string of code to shut out the instructions from the stolen control orb. But, suspended inside a Morphobot, it took the centaur at least half a minute. As soon as the readout flashed green, Foley networked with the remaining bots and instructed them to dissolve. Half a second later, Juliet and Foley flopped to the floor, tears in their eyes, gel in their windpipes. Artemis lay unmoving, still unconscious from his electrocution. Butler landed on his feet, spat, and attacked. Poor Bob Ragby never had a chance, not that Butler did much to him. All it took was one kick, then the dwarf's ter ter terror took hold and jetted him straight into the lip of a metal bunk. He collapsed with a surprisingly childlike moan. Butler turned quickly to Artemis and checked his pulse. How's Artemis' heart? asked Juliet, bending to check on Mulch. It's beating, replied her brother. That's about all I can tell you. We need to get him over to that hospital ship. Mulch, too. The dwarf coughed, then muttered something about beer and cheese pies. Do you mean beer and cheese pies, or beer and cheese pies? Juliet glanced at her butt brother. Mulch may be delirious, it's hard to tell. Butler took Bob Ragby's gun from his belt and tossed it bodily onto Foley's broad back. Okay, here's the strategy. We take Artemis and Mulch across to the Nostriamus' sickbay, then I retrieve Holly if necessary. Juliet's head snapped back. But Foley can do- Get moving, thundered Butler. Go immediately, I do not want to talk about this. Okay, but if you're not with us in five minutes, I'm coming after you. I would appreciate that said Butler, propping Mulch on Foley's back, then the unconscious Artemis. And if you could bring any troops you find along the way, that'd be great. Troops on a hospital ship, said Foley, trying his best not to smell what was on his back. You'll be lucky. Mulch's tongue lolled out, resting on the centaur's neck. <sighs> he mumbled out around his tongue. Ours tasty. Let's go, let's go right now said Foley nervously. The ambience was a small ship compared to the massive aquanaut that loomed over them. The little craft had two levels, a sick bay and cell downstairs, and on top of the spiral staircase, a bridge with a small trucker's cabin, and apart from a couple of nooks for storage and recycling, and the room in which they had been imprisoned, that was it. Luckily for Butler and the others, the umbilical across to the Nostriamus was on the bottom level. Ching Mao was peering across through the umbilical, obviously waiting for Holly to return with the demon warlock. Please, whispered Juliet when they saw the goblin at the hatch. Allow me. Bella was holding both Artemis and Mulch steady on Foley's back. Bob Ragby he was not so worried about. Knock yourself out, he said. Or rather, knock the other guy out. Being a wrestler, Juliet could not simply run at Ching Mao and knock him out. She had to add a little drama. She ran down the corridor, crying hysterically. Help me, Mr. Goblin! Save me! Ching removed his fingers from the bite marks on the skull he was forever scratching, which of course meant that they would never heal properly. Uh, save you from what? Juliet sniffed. There's a big ugly goblin trying to stop us from leaving the ship! Mayo reached for his gun. There's a what? A big ugly guy with all those septic dents in his head! Ching licked his eyeballs. Septic dents? Hey, wait a minute. Finally, said Juliet, and pirouetted like an ice skater, whacking Ching Mao with her signature jade ring. 
he tumbled into the umbilical passage, sliding down to the low point. Julia caught his weapon before it hit the deck. One more down, she said. You couldn't have just punched him in the head, grumbled Butler, leaning fully past her. Boo hoo, help me, I'm a girl. What kind of modern woman are you? A smart one, said Juliet. He never even got a shot off. Butler was not impressed. He should never have got a low hand on his gun. Next time, just hit the goblin. You're lucky he didn't blast you with a fireball. Oh no, said Foley, pushing through a rope curtain that seemed to be coated with disinfectant and into the umbilical passage. No flame near the umbilical. This is a pressurized tube with an oxygen helium mix, heavy on the oxygen because of the pressure. One spark in here and first we explode, then the tube ruptures and the ocean squashes us flat. One by one, they stepped into the umbilical. It was an incredible construction. A double-skinned tomb of transparent, super-tough plastic, strengthened by a, with a wrap of octagonal wire mesh. Air pumps hummed loudly along its length, and light orbs drew deep-sea creatures to it, including Artemis' giant squid, which had wrapped itself around the umbilical central span and was gnawing at the plastic, smearing long whelps along the tube. Don't worry, said Foley confidently. That creature can't get through. We've done thousands of stress tests. With an actual giant squid? asked Juliet, understandably concerned. No, said, admitted Foley. So just computer test then. Absolutely not, said Foley, offended. We used a normal squid and a tiny umbilical model. It worked quite well until one of my dwarf assistants fancies some calamari. Juliet shuddered. It's just that, that I have a thing about a giant squid. Don't we all, said Foley, and clopped past her down the umbilical. The passage was 50 yards long, with a slight incline at either end. The walkway beneath her, their feet was coated with a slightly tacky substance to prevent any accidental sparking, and they were fire-extinguishing scatter bombs at regular intervals that would automatically coat the tube with powder in the event of a fire breaking out. Foley pointed at one of the fire-extinguishing bombs. In all honesty, those are for show. If so much as a spark gets loose in here, not even the squid is going to survive. They proceeded across to the aquanaut, feeling the cold of the ocean radiate through the walls, breathing the sharp, oxygen-rich air. The Nostremus hospital ship loomed above, four stories high, curved green walls dotted by a thousand glowing portholes, anchored to the seabed by a dozen bus-sized anchors. Umbilicals stretched from several ports, and shadowy figures could be seen shuffling across from their ships to the Nostremus. It was a somber, surreal image. Fully led, carrying Artemis, Mulch, and a snoring Bob Ragby, complaining every step of the way. Passengers! Centaurs don't carry passengers! Just because we have a horse's torso doesn't mean we have a horse's temperament! This is demeaning, that's what it is! Neither Juliet nor Butler took any notice. They were in a dangerous stretch right now, and any confrontation had to be quickly contained, or it could mean a watery grave for them all. On Foley's back, Artemis moaned and stirred. Butler patted his shoulder. You just stay asleep, young man. No need to wake up now. As much respect as Butler had for Artemis' abilities, he couldn't think how they could help in this situation, especially with that angry-looking rune burned into his neck. They were two-thirds of the way across when the hatch of the Nostriamus slid open, and Holly stepped through, followed by number one. There was no emotion in Holly's eyes, but she calmly assessed the situation and drew the neutrino from her holster, taking a quick bead on Butler's forehead. From the look on her face, she could have been about to shoot a dart at the fairground target. No, Captain Short, said Turnbull's voice from behind Butler. No guns in here. Turnbull stood at the entrance to the ambulance with the Unix, as ever, at one shoulder, and Arc Sewell hovering at the other. Juliet was on rear guard duty. It's the Jolly Pirate, she called to her brother, and his merry idiots. I think that without guns we're in a pretty good shape. Should I go over there and beat some respect for life into them? Butler held up two fingers. Wait. This was a nightmare scenario for any bodyguard. Stuck in the middle of a transparent tube, several miles underwater, with a murdering band of fugitives at one end and an enthralled but still highly skilled police officer at the other. Poor number one had no idea what kind of drama he had stepped into. Holly, what, what's going on? Are we in the middle of one of your big adventures? Should I zap someone? Holly stood impassively waiting for instructions, but Butler heard what number one had said. No magic, number one. One spark could blow up the entire platform. Number one sighed. Can't you people ever just go on a picnic or something? Do there always have to be explosions? Artemis moaned again, then slid off from behind Mulch off Foley's back onto the walkway. Standing in the doorway of the stolen shuttle ambience, 
gazing down the umbilical toward Butler, Turnbull realized that he had a few marked cards in the deck. Ah, my little genius awakes. This should make our game interesting. Butler turned sideways to make himself a smaller target. There would be no guns in this showdown, but there could be blades. Go back inside, he called to number one. Go in and shut the hatch. The demon warlock tapped Holly's shoulder. Should I go in, Holly? Would that be the best thing to do? Holly did not answer, but with that touch, number one felt the rune spell that squatted like a parasite on her mind. It seemed purple to him, and malignant, and somehow aware. In his imagination, the reptilian rune crouching on Holly's brain snarled at him and nipped it with venomous teeth. Ow! said number one, withdrawing his finger sharply. I couldn't do the spell, he thought, but it would be delicate work to avoid brain damage and there would definitely be sparks. He took a slow step backward, but Holly quickly walked around him and smashed the heel of her hand into the door mechanism, singling it for as long as it took for maintenance to get a ferry down here, which would be way too long. No running away, young master demon, called Turnball. I have need of your magic. My magic, thought number one. There must be something I can do. The mesmer doesn't require any sparks. Listen to me, Holly, said the, said the demon warlock, his voice multi-layered with magic. Look into my eyes. Which was as far as he got before Holly brought the edge of her hand down in a chopping motion that hit number one accurately in the gap between the armor plates on his chest and neck right in the windpipe. The demon collapsed to the ground, gasping. It would be minutes before he could do as much as squeak. Turnbull laughed cruelly. Ha ha ha! Rune trumps Mesmer, I would say. Butler tried to ignore the more extreme circumstances, such as the explosive gas they were breathing and the giant squid giving them the evil eye from outside the umbilical tube, and treat the situation as a common alley brawl. I've been in this situation a dozen times. Admittedly, we are flanked, but Julian and I could take these and a dozen more. Holly can fight, but she's mesmerized, and that will slow her down. Why is Turnbull so confident that with only a gnome and a sprite by his side? Ready, sister, he said. Say the word. I'll take Turnbull and his friend. You contain Holly without doing any damage if you can manage it. Okay, brother. What should I do? Asked Foley, trying to keep the Winnie out of his voice. Stand over Mulch and Artemis. Keep them safe. Very well, butler, said the centaur, feeling utterly helpless as he always did in violent situations. You can count on me. Butler and Judy switched sides, touching hands briefly on the way past. Be careful, Holly is quick. You too, I don't trust that turnball guy. Both of these statements would surely prove themselves true. Unfortunately, butler had formulated their plan of attack without two vital pieces of information. First of all, Holly was not mesmerized, she was enthralled by a rune, and where the mesmer slowed the enchanted person down, runes certainly did not. In fact, they gave the victim access to more life force than they normally would have, which is why long-term thralls must not be allowed to get too excited for too long, or they would literally burn themselves out. The second piece of information Butler did not have was the fact that Turnbull had anticipated he might have to fight his way through an umbilical, and so was armed accordingly. The butlers were down within seconds of each other. Juliet ran full tilt for Holly. No chatter or exaggerated wrestling moves. Holly was a serious opponent. The serious opponent stood listlessly, arms dangling until the last possible moment. Then she ducked low, so quickly that it seemed a ghost image hung in the space where she had been, and swept Juliet's legs from under her. Juliet banged her head hard on the walkway, and by the time her vision cleared, Holly was on her chest with a neutrino leveled at Juliet's head. No sparks panted Juliet. No sparks. No sparks, repeated Holly dully, then stuffed the gun barrel down the front of Juliet, Jade's Princess Leotard, and pulled the trigger. Juliet spasmed once, then collapsed. There were no sparks. At the other end of the conduit, Butler had not rushed forward with quite so much gusto. If things were as they seemed, he could easily defeat Turnbull and his little hench fairies. Perhaps a menacing approach would be enough to scare them into running away. Turnbull seemed a little irritated and not at all scared. Mr. Butler, as a manservant to a great strategist, didn't it occur to you that another great strategist, such as myself, might have anticipated this moment, or one like it? Butler's stomach sank. Turnbull is armed. Butler's only option was to cover the remaining distance before Turnbull managed to aim his weapon. He almost made it. But then, almost in a fight is about as useful as rubber needles in a knitting contest. 
Turnbo unclipped the stumpy weapon on a lanyard behind his back and shot Butler eight times in the chest and head. The bodyguard's eyes rolled back in his head, but the momentum drove him forward, and Turnbo had skipped smartly to one side to avoid being crushed. Arksul and Unix were not so lucky. Butler landed on them like a meteor, driving every gasp of air from their bodies and breaking several ribs. Olé! said Turnbull, who made a point of attending the bullfights whenever he was in Spain, not seeming too upset by the loss of his crew. The vibration set off one of the fire extinguisher powder packs, which must have been on a hair trigger and filled the umbilical with floating white powder. Oh, the weather outside is frightful, sang Turnbull, pointing his gun at Foley, who was trying to at least look brave. Do you like my weapon? It was developed for crowd control during the first Goblin Riots. Purely chemical. Shoots Zapolidum of tartrate knockout pellets. Gas powder with dissolvable shells. No sparks. Sometimes low tech is the way to go. Artemis suddenly drew a lungful of air as though he had just breached the ocean surface. Ah, my genius surfaces. Stand up, Artemis, I command you. Artemis lurched to his feet, his head and clothes matted with white powder. Choke that centaur for me, would ya? There followed an uncomfortable minute while Artemis tried to find some purchase on Foley's broad neck, then squeezed with all the power in his fingers, which was not very much. Foley was more embarrassed than hurt. Turnbull wiped a tear from his eye. Oh, this is just too much. But I indulge myself. Lenore is waiting. Come here, Artemis, and you too, Captain Short. Bring the demon. We must be gone from here before the ambulance generator blows. Artemis and Holly did as they were told with the emotion of automatons. Holly yanked poor gasping number one along by the collar of his tunic, and Artemis stepped past Foley without a glance. Outside the conduit, the fish and squid paid close attention to this fascinating diversion from the dreariness of everyday subaquatic life. Suddenly, Turnbob was impatient to be off. Come now, my thralls, where's the speed you're famous for? Artemis did speed up, showing a nimbleness that anyone who knew the boy would not associate with him. That's more like it, said Turnbull. I may keep you, Artemis. That's nice, said the human boy. I'll tell him when I see him. Uh, said Turnbull, puzzled. Then the boy who looked like Artemis Fowl jabbed Turnbull in the gut with stiffened fingers. Butler showed Artemis that one a thousand times, said the boy. He didn't listen, but I did. Turnbull wanted to say something, but he was winded, and even if he hadn't been, he had no idea what he would have said. For I am not Artemis Fowl, villainous elf said Orion, twisting the gun from Turnbull's fingers. I am the young romantic who always knows his day would come, so I listen to Butler, and I'm ready. Turnbull got enough breath back for one word. Ow. Artemis knew he had to escape the power of the rune, which controlled his mind, but not mine, so he goaded your crenshaw's minion into shocking him, which released me. Turnbull clasped his stomach. Of course, Atlantis stage two. He rested both elbows on his knees and rasped at Holly. Kill him! Kill the boy! Orion pivoted and aimed the gun at Holly. Please, sweet maiden, do not force my hand or for I will strike for the good of all. Holly threw number one aside and ran full tilt side to side. Artemis can never shoot, she snarled. Orion squared his shoulders and extended his hand, supporting his right hand with his left. Both Artemis and Orion were ambidextrous, but, unlike Artemis, Orion favored his right hand. He remembered what Art Butler had said time and time again. Sight along your arm, breathe out and squeeze. The first pellet caught Holly in the cheek, the second on the forehead, and the third on the shoulder, which took a second to penetrate. Holly's speed took her halfway up the curved wall before her body gave out, and she slid back down to on her face. Orion turned to Turnbull, who was sneaking up on him. Be still, foul demon! Hey, said number one, who was getting his breath back. Apologies, gentle mage, said Orion. I was referring to my pyrotechnical foe. Four, said Turnbull with some desperation. Four, four, four. Orion laughed a haughty hero's laugh. Ha <laughs> ha, no such luck, Turnbull Root. Your evil plans have been thwarted, except your fate. Turnbull's face turned slowly purple, a family trait. I need the demon, he bellowed, spittle spraying from his lips. Turn him over or we all die. Too late for hollow threats, my friend. You have been outfoxed. Now sit still while my compadre, the noble steed, binds your hands. 
Turnbull let a whooping breath and stood erect. No, I have one card left to play. The ambulance is rigged to explode. The autopilot is smashed and the generator has been exposed. There's no turning back. Give me the demon I will pilot the shuttle deep into the trench, then escape in the belly of our morphobot. There's room for one more besides Lenore. I can take you instead of number one. Foley sucked his lips. Ah, okay, a little problem with that plan. I dissolve the bots. So that was your plot, said Orion fiercely, brandishing the gun like a cutlass. You would take what you wanted and then bury the evidence in the explosion. Turnbull shrugged, suddenly calm. He had always known a day like this would come. It's worked for me before. He consulted a timer on his wrist computer. In five minutes, the shuttle explodes and we all die. If you will excuse me, I must go to my wife's bedside. He turned to find his wife a little closer than expected. Lenore stood framed by the umbilical's curtain, leaning heavily on her walking stick, face pale in the glow from the light orbs. Turnbull, what is happening? She said, her breath labored, but both eyes were open and were clear. Clearer than they had been since they'd first met. Turnbull rushed to her side, supporting her with one arm. Yes, my dear, you should lie down. Things will be better soon. Term Lenore snapped as she had not for a long time. You just said the ship will explode. Turnbull's eyes were wide with surprise. His beloved wife had never snapped at him before, but he kept a gentle smile on his lips. What does it matter so long as we're together? Even death will not separate us. From somewhere, Lenore found the strength to stand straight. I'm ready for my long sleep, Turnbull. But you are young. These people are young. And is that not a hospital ship we are moored to? Yes, yes it is. But these people are my enemies. They have persecuted me. Turnbull licked the rune on his thumb, but Lenore was beyond his power now. I think that perhaps you were far from blameless, my love. But I was blinded by love. I've always loved you, Turnbull. I always will. Orion was getting anxious. The seconds were ticking away and he had no wish to see his beloved Holly at the heart of an explosion. Step aside, madam, he said to Lenore. I must pilot the ship deep into the trench. Lenore raised her stick shakily. No, I will take this journey alone. I have outstayed my welcome on this earth and shut my eyes to what was happening around me. Now at last, I will fly whenever I never thought possible. She stroked Turnbull's wet cheek and kissed him. At least I can fly again, Turnbull. Turnbull clasped his wife's shoulders tenderly. You can fly, you will, but not now. This flight is death, and I cannot be without you. Don't you want what we had? Those times were gone, said Lenore simply. Perhaps they never should have been. Now, you must let me go, or else you may try to stop me. This was an ultimatum that Turnbull had been dreading since first applying the rune to Lenore's neck. He was about to lose his wife and there was nothing he could do about it. His emotions played across his face and a network of lines appeared around his eyes as though drawn by an invisible pen. I must go, Turnbull, said Lenore softly. Fly, my love, he said Turnbull, and he seemed in that moment as old as his wife. Let me do this for you, my love. Let me save you as you saved me all those years ago. Lenore kissed him again and withdrew through the curtain. Turnbull stood for a moment, shoulders shuddering, chin down. Then he pulled himself together. He faced Orion and jerked a thumb toward the ambulance. I should go. Lenore will never make it back up those steps on her own. And with such an ordinary statement, he was gone, the hatch sealing behind him. Understated, but graceful said Orion. A nice exit. The butlers were both unconscious, which would be a source of some ribbon and embarrassment later, so they did not see the stolen ambulance shuttle detach itself from the umbilical conduit and peel away from the Nostriemus, Lenore and Turnbull clearly visible at the cockpit controls, and they completely missed the shuttle diving deep into the Atlantis trench in a long, graceful arc. That woman is quite a pilot, said Orion. I'd imagine they are holding hands now and smiling bravely. Moments later, a hellfire blossom grew from the depths of the trench, but the explosion was quickly extinguished by the millions of tons of water bearing down on it. The shock currents, however, raced along the raised at ridge, dislodging centuries-old coral and rippling the untethered end of the umbilical conduit like a child would a skipping rope, sending the squid scurrying for safety. 
the tube's occupants were jumbled together, heroes and villains alike, and swept to the Nostramus' door, which moments later was opened from the inside by a confused technical officer, a hardened sea gnome, who, to his eternal shame, squealed like a baby stripe when he came face to face with a gigantic human covered in white dust. ZOMBIE! he shrieked, and unfortunately for him, two of his shift buddies were in the airlock behind him, and it cost him three weeks pudding rations to buy their silence. Artemis woke to find Holly and Foley leaning over him. Holly seemed concerned, whereas Foley was scrutinizing him as one would a lab experiment. I'm not in pain, thought Artemis. They must have given me something. And then, I should lighten the mood. Ah, my princess, noble steed, how does the morning find you both? Damn it, said Holly. It's the knight in shining armor. Hmm, said Foley. That's how Atlantis goes. As it progresses, you can never predict what will sell it off. I thought the cocktail drugs of a cocktail of drugs would bring back Artemis, but at least Orion will tell us what Artemis is up to. He leaned in closer. Orion, you noble youth, do you happen to know the password to Artemis's firewall? Of course I do, said Artemis. It's D O N K E Y space B O Y. Fully was halfway through writing this down when the penny dropped. Oh, ha ha, Artemis, most hilarious. I knew it was you all the time. Holly did not laugh. That's not funny, Artemis. Atlantis Complex is not a joke. At the mere mention of the disease, Artemis felt the nest of malignant force stir at the back of his head. Not again, he thought. It would really help if you two swapped places, he said, trying to sound calm and in control. Also, could you close those two porthole blinds all the way, or open all the way, but not in the middle like that? That makes no sense. Holly wanted to shake Artemis until he snapped out of it, but she talked to Dr. Argon of the Psych Brotherhood, and he told them to humor the human until they could get him checked into the clinic. Opal Cowboy's old room is still free, the doctor had said brightly, and Holly suspected that he was already thinking of titles for the inevitable book. So she said, Okay, Artemis, I'll get the blinds. As Holly tapped the little sun icon behind the blind, lighting the glass, she noticed the shoals of exotic fish basking in the pod light from the Nostromus' stern fins. We were all swimming toward the light, she realized, and then wondered when she'd become so philosophical. Too much thinking is one of the things that put Artemis where he is now. We need to deal with this problem. Artemis, she said, forcing a note of positivity into her voice. Dr. Argon wondered if you had any kind of record of my descent into madness, completed Artemis. Well, he actually said the complex's progression. He said keeping a journal of some kind is common among sufferers. They felt a great need to be understood after... Again, Artemis completed the sentence. After we die, I know. I feel the compulsion still. He tugged off the ring from his middle finger. It's my favorite communicator, remember? I kept a video diary. Should make terrifying viewing. Foley took the ring. Let me zap back back down to Argon. It will give him a little insight before he gets you strapped into the crazy chair. The centaur realized what he had said. Sorry. Cabaline is always saying how insensitive I am. There's no crazy chair. It's more like a couch or a futon. We get it, Foley, said Holly. Thank you very much. The centaur clomped to the hospital's room automatic door. Okay, I'll send this off. See you later, and watch out for those evil fours. Artemis winced. Holly was right. The Atlantis complex was not funny. Holly sat on the chair beside his bed. It was a very high-tech bed with stabilizers and impact cushions, but unfortunately a little short. You're growing, Artemis, she said. Artemis smiled weakly. I know, not fast enough in some ways. Holly took his hand. You can try to upset yourself if you want, but you won't be able to. Foley pumped enough sedative into you to make put a horse to sleep. They both smiled at that for a moment, but Artemis was in a melancholy mood. This adventure was different, Holly. Usually someone wins and we we're better off in the end. But this time, so many people died, innocents, and no one has benefited. And all for love. I can't even think of Turnbull as a villain. All he wanted was his wife back. Holly squeezed Artemis' fingers. Things would have been a lot worse without us around. Number one is alive, thanks to you, not to mention everyone on this hospital ship. And as soon as we have you back to your old self, we can get you working on saving the world with that ice cube. Good, that's still my priority, though I might want to renego renegotiate my terms a little. I thought you might. Artemis took a sip of water from a cup on his locker. I don't want to go back to being me completely. 
my old self is what brought on Atlantis Complex in the first place. You did some bad things, Artemis, but we, you wouldn't do them again. Let them go. Really? You, you can just let things go? It's not that easy, but you can do it with our help if that's what you really want. Artemis rolled his eyes. Potions and therapy, heaven help me. Dr. Argonim is a bit of a fame hound, but he's good. The best. Also, I'm sure number one could give you magical detox. Get the last of those sparks out of your system. That sounds painful. Maybe, but you'll have friends around you. Good friends. Artemis sat up on the pillows. I know. Where's Mulch? Where do you think? I think he's in the galley, possibly inside one of the refrigerators. I think you're probably right. How about Juliet? Holly's sigh was both affectionate and frustrated. She's organized a wrestling match between herself and a jumbo pixie who passed a comment about her ponytail. I'm currently pretending I don't know anything about it. I should go and break it up soon. I pity the pixie, said Artemis. And how about Butler? Do you think he can ever trust me again? I think he already does. I need to speak to him. Holly glanced toward the corridor. You'd better give him a minute. He's making a delicate phone call. Artemis could guess who he was calling. He would have to make a similar call soon himself. So, he said, trying to sound more lighthearted than he actually felt, with the Atlantis complex bubbling at the base of his temporal lobe. Arrange this, it said. Count that. Beware of four. Four is death. I heard that you were on a date with com Trouble Kelp. Are you two planning on building a bivouac anytime soon? Butler thought he might be developing claustrophobia. It definitely seemed as though the walls were closing in. It didn't help that the corridor he was crouched in was built for people half his size. The only place he could stand up properly was the gymnasium, and that wasn't really a place to make a private call, as his baby sister was probably beating the stuffing out of the jumbo pixie in there in a moment, playing it up for the assembled crowd of patients and medics who would soon adore the Jade Princess. Butler slid down the wall into a sitting position and held out Artemis' phone. Maybe there's no network, he thought hopefully. But there was. Four bars. Artemis had built his phone to access all available networks, including military and ferry. A person would have to be on the moon before Artemis' phone would fail. Okay, stop putting it off. Make the call. Butler scrolled through the contacts and selected Angeline Fowle's mobile phone. It took a few seconds to connect as the call had to go through Haven up to a satellite and back to Ireland and when it did ring, the tone was the fairy triple beep. Maybe she's asleep. But Angeline picked up on the second ring. Artemis, where are you? Why have you called? No, Mrs. Fowl, it's Butler. Angeline realized that Butler was calling her on Artemis' phone and naturally jumped to the worst possible conclusion. Oh my god, he's dead, isn't he? I should never have let him go. No, no, Artemis is fine, said Butler hurriedly. Not a mark on him. Angeline was crying into the phone. Oh, thank goodness. I would have blamed myself. A 15-year-old off to save the world with fairies. What was I thinking? That's it now. Finished. A normal life from now on. I can't even remember normal, thought Butler. Can I speak to him? Here we go. Not at the moment. He's... Uh... Sedated. Sedated? You said he wasn't hurt, Butler. You just said there wasn't a mark on him. Butler winced. There isn't a mark on him, not on the outside. Butler swore he could hear Angeline Fowl fuming. What is that supposed to mean? Are you turning metaphorical in your dotage, man? Is Artemis hurt or not? Butler would have preferred to be facing down a SWAT team than delivering this news, so he chose his words carefully. Artemis developed a condition, a mental condition. It's a little like OCD. Oh no, said Angeline, and for a moment Butler thought she had dropped the phone. Then he heard her breathing, fast and shallow. It can be controlled, he said. We're taking him to a clinic right now, the best clinic the fairies have. He's in absolutely no danger. I want to see him. You will. They're sending someone for you. This wasn't actually the case, but Butler vowed that it would be seconds after he hung up the phone. What about the twins? The nanny can sleep over. Artemis' father was in Sao Paulo at the summit. I'll have to tell him everything. No, said Butler quickly. Don't make that decision now. Talk to Artemis first. But will he know me? Of course he will, 
Butler replied. Very well, Butler. I'm going to pack a bag now. Tell the fairies to call when they're ten minutes away. Will do. And, Butler? Yes, Mrs. Fowl? Look after my boil until I get there. Family is everything, you know that. I do, Mrs. Fowl. I will. The connection was severed and Angeline Fowl's picture disappeared from the little screen. Family is everything, thought Butler, if you're lucky. Mulch stuck his head around the door, beard dripping with some congealing liquid that seemed to have whole turnips trapped inside it. His forehead was covered in bright blue burn gel. Hey, bodyguard, you better get down to the gymnasium. That jumbo pixie guy is killing your sister. Really? said Butler, unconvinced. Really? Julia just doesn't seem to be herself. She can't even put two moves together. It's pathetic, really. Everyone's betting against her. I see, said Butler, straining as much as he could in the cramped surroundings. Mulch held the door. It's going to make things really interesting when you show up to help. Butler grinned. I'm not coming to help. I just want to be there when she stops faking. Ah, said Mulch, comprehension dawning on his face. So I should switch my bet to Juliet? You certainly should, said Butler, and lumbered down the corridor, stepping around a pool of turnip soup. <laughs>